Okay, so. <laughs> God, it's like having the hiccups. I, I'm consciously hating that phrase now, but anyway. Um, so, in this uh, video that I made here on the right, uh, I'm not sure whether that's going to go before or after the clip that I'm about to make here. But I'm trying to show you guys physically the router on a strict, uh, stick preparation. When it was on site, I really only showed you the switch prep. So I'm going to explain it a little bit for you now. So if we look here, you'll see that uh, port 1 from the uh, router is connected to port 1 on the edge switch. Okay. Now the edge switch is actually running in PoE plus on that port. So it's giving it a solid 40 watts, right? 48 volts, 0.75 amps. That's more than enough to power the um, 4011. Even when it's under full duty, uh, you won't actually see it pull that much more power than that, right? Um, moving over to a different screen for a second here. There we go. All right. Now, the other thing that you didn't see was that I also installed a jumper cable from SFP1 on the 4011 to port 10 on the 4011. Now, I'm sure you're asking, well, why didn't you run a uh, DAC from SFP1 over well, by the way you have to use active DACs just so that you know on the 4011 but why didn't you run a DAC from SFP1 to the uh, SFP on the 4011 and the simple answer is I could have but I didn't um, so just for simplicity's sake for the client I basically just ran another little jumper cable like this from port 10 on the, the router uh, to SFP1 on the um, switch now the reason why we do that is because all of our upstream traffic is being handled by uh, port 1 over here and anything going downstream of this site is going to go through port 10 here So this comes down to switch planning um, So if you know how the 4011 operates, it's actually got technically three interface groups So you've got like port 1 through 5 here That's actually switch 1 and then you've got ports 6 through 10 that switch 2 and then the SFP plus is actually direct to CPU so there's technically three interfaces on this, three true interfaces uh, connecting to the CPU on this thing. And so that means that, uh, you know, you can get about, uh, what, about uh, 2.5 gigs uh, off this switch group here and a solid 10 off the other one there. Um, so that being said, what we want to do is rather than actually put everything on one switch group, which is where we're going to see um, truncation, we're going to see a bottleneck, we're using both the switch groups, one for upstream, one for downstream. That means the traffic will come in on the first switch group and it'll exit on the second switch group there to the actual switch, the actual tower switch, the PoE switch. Um, now, you, another way you can do this is bonding, but uh, I'm not sure on the 4011. Let's actually, let's just check that. I'm not sure if we can bond uh, interfaces from uh, two different, uh, let's try bonding ports. I think that uh, it's a cool little experiment actually. No, while thinking out loud. So I port five and port six are not doing anything. So let's try bonding those because they're in two different switch groups and see what happens. Port five, port six, and we'll call this uh, uh, Ghibli. And let's uh, go in safe mode just in case I screw anything up. Ha! Oh, it's already in the bridge. Hold on. Uh, we'll just disable that there. Cool. Okay, so we can actually do uh, two ports from uh, separate switches on here. Uh, switch groups. Cool. But anyway, I digress. What I'm, I'm rambling now. The whole idea here is that I want my upstream to go through switch 1 and my downstream to leave through switch 2 so that we're not uh, bottlenecking on switch 1 by using its interface to the CPU. So now, I've already shown you in this little video here on the right how I programmed this at the edge switch, okay? But let's take a look at how I programmed the Microtech. Now, I ended up changing the configuration because that stupid RJ45 SFP right there, which was not from FS, it was actually from Amazon, uh, turned out to actually cause me a lot of grief. So um, at this point in time, I'm waiting for the replacement to show up, which I ordered from FS.com, those lovely people there. And as soon as it gets here, I'll be able to configure it properly. But um, here's our VLANs. So this is router on a stick in its simplest form. So in the switch here, you'll see all the interfaces and how I configured them and how there is, um, let's see here. So you see how, like right now, like I said, the uh, SFP RJ45 adapter needs to be replaced. So we're just temping this. Uh, but basically you've got two modes for a VLAN. You've got tagged and untagged in the most simplest form. I'm not getting into Q and Q or anything else like that. So what we've done here is um, Misty and Justin are two point-to-point -point links 
4003 is the uh, AP, bridge group, and 10 is management, which is for all the last mile equipment, okay? That's just a general practice I like to use. Um, so what we've done is, is that all the APs here are untagged on uh, 4003, and in fact, we don't necessarily need that there at all, so I'm gonna turn it off. Um, now you'll see that it's tagged. So VLAN 4003 is tagged on port one, okay? And it's untagged on port nine. So normally what would be happening right now is that um, because port nine is all untagged traffic, it's part of a little bridge group here, which means that this is kind of an open broadcast domain. So wherever you, whatever you send into uh, the SFP here, SFP one, port nine on the switch, it'll just broadcast right across these ports here. Um, so what I was doing previously was um, like this. Now temporarily though, because you know we've got uh, a bad SFP, what I did was I just tagged it on port one. So that means that it's all untagged traffic, which means that whatever you plug in there, it just works uh, inside this bridge, right? But then as it exits the bridge on the tagged port, the tag for VLAN 4003 is added to all the traffic leaving uh, interface one on this switch which means that as it enters ETH1 on the RB4011, I need to actually untag it somewhere. So what I did here was I created another VLAN, which is tagged on Ethernet1, as you can see. This is basically tagged right here. That's what a tag is. And then the way that you untag a VLAN in a microtech is you simply add that VLAN to an interface, in, or a uh, bridge, sorry. So I added VLAN 4003 here to a bridge, which means that now it's untagged inside of that bridge and it's tagged on this interface. Untagged, tagged, untagged, tagged. Does that make sense? So now what about management VLAN 10? Well, I tagged that on the upstream port because it's minimalist traffic. There's like nothing there. But look, you see how all the access points are untagged over here and they're tagged here. It's all tagged for VLAN 10. That's because I want VLAN 10 to carry through. So by tagging it on port 1, that means that port 1 will see it here. The physical interface will see VLAN 10. And also all these interfaces here will export. So the VLAN 10 traffic will actually exit on those interfaces as well. So the reason why we do that is basically with Ubiquiti users, you just enable management VLAN, you punch in 10, and now you've got uh, all your devices on a management VLAN. Pretty cool, eh? So what that does is that lifts all of your devices out of the last miles broadcast domain so that customers can't directly access it. When you enable your, enable your layer two isolation and client AP isolation, um, yeah, the customers can't do anything. All they can do is talk to the router that they're connected to and through proper lockdown, they won't be able to do anything there either. All right, so I digress yet again. Now let's take a look at a point to point link because that's where it gets important, okay? So we've got our OSPF stuff here. We've got our uh, point to point interfaces as you can see. Got Misty and J uh, Justin. All right, so this is what's called port-based VLAN on these guys here. So VLAN 102 is basically, an, it's a dedicated interface on the switch coming back to here. So pretend that the, the switch itself is almost like an extension of the router now. Same with port three. Now, if you're wondering why I chose 102 and 103, it's because this is switch number one, port two, 102, and switch number one, port three, 03. So 102, 103. So if we look at that now, Misty, so it's tagged because she's the upstream. So it's tagged on port one and it's untagged on port two. So that means that uh, the traffic itself, whatever you plug into port two here, will just be like plugging to a regular switch. But as the traffic passes through ethernet one here, it becomes tagged as 102. To retrieve that tag, we create an interface here. So we've got VLAN 102 tagged on ETH1, switch zero, port one, upstream, okay? Now I can attach my IP address to it for my OSPF, which is right here. So that's now an interface in this router, okay? And we put the IP address onto that interface and we've added it into the OSPF so that it carries, okay? So that's basically that interface is now just an interface that's been taken from the switch and added into this router. Same thing with Justin here. See, tagged on port one, which it's actually supposed to be tagged on SFP one, but I explained that earlier in the video, uh, and it's untagged on port three. So there's our two point-to-point -point links. 
And then we've got our open bridge here specifically for uh, customer traffic. And now you're probably wondering why the hell didn't I just use VLAN 1 up here? Well, there's a reason for that. It's because on many of these switches like Natonix and Ubiquiti stuff, which you guys are uh, used to using, um, it's supposed to be simplistic. It's supposed to be simplified to the point that uh, it's really, really easy to work with. Um, so that's why there's certain things that are locked out in the GUIs and certain restrictions and whatnot. So essentially what happens here on these guys is by default, um, any ports that are in default VLAN 1 uh, are actually the management ports. So what I've done here is, is because 1 is being used as the upstream, it's basically just an uplink to the router. We've moved all the customer traffic to port 9. Now as you can see here, because all this customer stuff is uh, happening on port 9, um, 8, 7, 6, and 5, we don't want to have the management for the switch to be present inside of that broadcast domain. We don't want customers having any access to our core equipment. So we just created an extra bridge group for all the customer stuff. And I left this untagged strategically on port one. So now what that means is, is that port one on this guy, which I have stuck into the management bridge group, uh, is also used for the management of the switch. Cool, eh? And by the way, if you're wondering about VLAN one, that's kind of a base layer VLAN. By default, anything that you plug into a network is on PVID 1 or VLAN 1. That's kind of like the ground floor for VLANs. And in, in any switch fabric or matrix, however you want to call it, um, VLAN 1 is the ground floor, basically, and then we climb from there. So in summary, router on a stick is not that difficult. You basically, T means tag, U means untag, and you can only untag a port in one bridge. Otherwise, you're going to create a loop. So most of the software will lock you out of having the ability to do that. In fact, most command line stuff locks you out of the ability to do that. It'll say, oh, this is already in another bridge, unless you're running really old firmware on your equipment, okay? Cisco. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that being said, look here. VLAN 102, MISTI, is an interface inside of this router. It is tagged on ETH1. In the switch, MISTI is tagged on port 1 as well and untagged, so opened up on port 2. It's as simple as that. So now port 2 on the switch is now uh, an extension of this router. And there's its actual interface right there inside of the 4011. Let's look at Justin's now. Uh, Justin is untagged here on port 3 and it's tagged on port 1. And we look inside of this router and there it is. There's the actual extension of the switch. There's the actual interface in the 4011 for that port on the switch. So we're just using the switch as a way to add ports to a router, basically. Um, that's all there is to it. And then there's a bridge group and there's a management. Now, something else I need to show you is called port isolation. Layer 2 isolation, which is absolutely critical. Okay, so look here. I can actually click on the settings here, right? I can go isolate port. This is what's called layer 2 isolation, and it is critical that you do this on all of the interfaces that are part of that bridge group for your last mile stuff. Now don't get confused, we can actually go into more details about that later. So we've got, uh, let's see here, oh good, I never finished this one, that's awesome. So we've got five and six here, they're both isolated ports, see? So when you have port isolation enabled on switch ports inside of a switch group, it means that, yeah, let's see here, west, east, south, it means that those ports within that switch group cannot intercommunicate with each other. So we have these ports here, see, all untagged within the switch group, which means they can all interact with each other, right? We only want the traffic from these guys to funnel down through port 9, or in this case, port 1. So that means that what we want is we want port isolation on 1, 2, 3, 4, so 5, 6, 7, and 8, so that these interfaces cannot communicate. Traffic cannot pass between these interfaces within that bridge. Why do we do that? Well, I'm sure you'll find out when somebody plugs the router in backwards and they have a DHCP server on that router that uh, takes out half of your network. And that's why you enable client isolation on your AP and port uh, layer two isolation, port based isolation on your switch, or in some cases on your bridge itself with your micro ticks. If you've got stuff in the last mile, you can set a horizon value. And anything with the same horizon value cannot intercommunicate with anything else with that horizon value. We'll get into that stuff later, though. I don't want to get too in-depth. This is a 
VLAN video for like router on a stick, basically. Okay. So there you go, all you silly upright apes out there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. That's basically router on a stick. It's not that complicated um, unless you're using CLI and you're not comfortable using CLI, like with uh, some Juniper devices, some AdTran stuff, and some uh, Cisco stuff. But other than that, most of the stuff you guys are going to be working with is all WISP level. It's uh, entry-level carriers, so it's all GUI-based. That's all you need to know. But anyway, if you guys have any questions, uh, just leave them in the comments below and uh, or hit me up on the Miss Fix It Facebook group. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. So thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, have a great day. We'll catch you.